Jennifer Jules, a gardener who grows philosophy along with plants. Her award-winning NPR program and podcast, Cultivating Place, Conversations on Natural History and the Human Impulse to Garden, thoughtfully explores diverse and powerful voices across a local, national, and global community. An author, too, in her books, she extends her commitment to relationships between people and the spaces they inhabit. In 2020, she enriched our perceptions with the earth in her hands, 75 extraordinary women working in the world of plants. This May, she introduces us to gardeners who draw inspiration from nature rather than trying to dominate it in underwestern skies, visionary gardens from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Coast. Welcome, Jennifer. It is really great to actually see you. It is such a pleasure to be here, Linda, after speaking with you on my podcast a couple years back and uh, just being in conversation across the garden sphere these last few years. It is an honor to be here. So Jennifer, when I started gardening, I can't say that my initial focus was cultivating place. It was actually about planting whatever looked pretty at the nursery. So what prompted your perspective and focus with cultivating place? Great question, Linda. And, you know, I would say to you that I think most people's entry into gardening comes from just sheer interest and curiosity and attraction to exactly what you said, to what is lovely, what delights us, what is pretty, what smells good. Whether we're four years old and, you know, rambling around the garden with our parents or grandparents or neighbors, or whether we're in our mid-20s and we find this activity. But I think the estimates are that 18 million new gardeners started gardening last year alone in 2020. And prior to that in the U.S., we had about 49 million households engaged in gardening. And so I would say that most people enter for a specific reason. They want to grow something beautiful. They want to engage with their own survival. They want to, you know, ground themselves in a new home or provide a, an outlet for their children because they've just become parents. But I think that what keeps us gardening and as we grow as gardeners is that deep sense of connection that we get when we sort of find ourselves spacing out in the garden while we water in the evening or when we get distracted in the morning on the way to the car because we have to pick three weeds or we see like a caterpillar or a butterfly that, uh, that interests us and then we we realize that it's 20 minutes later. That engagement where we find ourselves fully interconnected and interdependent with the world around us, whether it's the plants or the weather or the soil or the wildlife, I think that is what keeps us in the garden. And that is what makes it more than just a hobby or a, a, you know, a garden housework chore. It, it makes it a spiritual and, and philosophical engagement that makes us bigger, better humans. And, and that's what I really wanted to explore in Cultivating Place was, you know, not how to do this, not the 10 best tips for X, Y, Z this year, but I, I really wanted to highlight those stories of people in those great moments. How did you hook up with NPR and North State Public Radio? That's also a funny story uh, that I love to share. And uh, just to clarify, Cultivating Place is a public radio program and podcast on the NPR affiliate, North State Public Radio, who is my co-producer. They are my little local station here in Northern California, Chico and the, the North State of California. And when I first moved to Northern California in 2007, I had been writing about gardens professionally for about 10 years. And I had uh, grown a little weary and a little skeptical about how mainstream media was portraying gardens and gardeners at that exact moment in our cultural, uh, you know, environment. And 
I felt like we had moved so far to the two dimensional image driven superficial that we had actually commodified our gardens in a way that I was uncomfortable with. And I, I knew that most gardeners that I spoke with also did not experience gardening the way it was showing up on glossy magazine pages. They experienced it as these great, you know, connected moments outside with the big world. And it was sort of reduced to throw pillows, good pots, and a great pair of boots that look cute. And, and that, you know, you and I know like that there, there might be one moment in a year where any one of our gardens might have one image worthy of that two dimensional, you know, glamour glitz. But the rest of the year, it's this like love affair between us and, and our gardens. And so I went, I was no longer happy just doing the, the sort of mainstream media writing about gardens that reduced it to this two dimensional plane. And I wanted to change up how I was engaging with gardens. And I thought I was driving down the street in my new hometown. I have two little baby girls uh, who I am spending most of my time caring for. I mean, that was my main job at the time. And uh, which I loved, it's the best job ever to be a mom. And, uh, but I heard a little um, like promo on my public radio station and I've always loved public radio and they were asking for volunteer PSA writers. And I thought public radio might be the perfect like voice for what I would like to do. And I thought I can write PSAs. So I, I called up the station and I said, I would be happy to be a volunteer PSA writer and reader, uh, but I have this ulterior motive, and that is that I would like to uh, propose to you a garden program because you don't have one. And there was this great old public radio guy named Joe O, and he had that great like public radio voice, and he said, well... I think that sounds like a great idea. Let's forget about the PSAs and let's get to this garden program. And he said, do you really think you have enough topics for a full year of programs? And I said, I think I do, Joe. And that was, you know, what, nine, nine years ago now. No more than that, 2007. So 13 years ago. And we've been putting out a, a weekly interview-based uh, radio program ever since. Well, good for Cho. I like this man. <laughs> yes. And I was sort of young and perky. And one of the other funny stories, Linda, was that he, he looked at me and he said, you're really perky. And I'm more like uh, oh, Lou Grant. And you are more like Mary Tyler Moore. And I don't really like perky. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he was very funny. He was a great supporter and teacher. Especially these days, you know, things are in this kind of state of transition for everybody. But do you record at the studio or at your house? I guess in the beginning it was at your at the studio. Up until March of 2020, I recorded at North State Public Radio in their studios. And every now and then we'll do a field recording, Linda. But most of the time I will be in the studio and almost always, especially since my program became this one hour program that we now know of as Cultivating Place, it has almost always been remote. So I almost never meet my, my gardeners that I'm speaking with. I am just hearing them through recording equipment and we engage over email or, um, but since March of 2020, I now record at home from my desk, looking out at my little front garden and my little suburban front street and um you know thankfully for technology which is a a bonus and a, and a drag sometimes as we know uh this has allowed me to record and now edit all of my own work from home and that's been a big help to the radio station in terms of staffing and people in the studio itself and we're only really just back up to having people in the studio again, but I will remain at home for the time being. Back in the day, you listened to the radio, and if you weren't at the radio, well, too bad for you. But now we have streaming, and then you developed a podcast, and how did that come about? 
my original program was called uh, In a North State Garden, and it was very regionally focused to the 10 counties in Northern California. And then in 2016, the radio station came to me and said, would you be interested in expanding this to a one hour program, uh, which it was smaller before that. And I said, I, I would, but I would like it to be more globally focused. And at that point I had been producing my first program for about nine years and it felt like I was ready to kind of go further afield. And so it became Cultivating Place and now I can interview people from anywhere in the world. When we did that in 2016, Joe O had retired and we had young people who were coming up in the station doing the engineering and the production. And it was just second nature to them to say, oh, we, well, let's just put this on all the podcast platforms because podcasting was kind of young at, the point, at that point, but it was, it was not that young. And so it was really easy to put it out over the different platforms. And then the podcast is just a little bit different than the on-air program so that I have just a little more room to chat to listeners um, in the breaks where there would normally be supporter messages on air. And so that's kind of nice because it gives me a flexibility if a guest, you know, if we want to go a little longer, I don't have to cut them off hard for the, for the podcast part. And my engineer, Matt Fiddler, helps bring it down to size for the on-air piece and then leave it a little longer for the podcast. Then um, in 2020, you released um, The Earth in Her Hands, 75 Extraordinary Women Working in the World of Plants. And this was one of my treasured pandemic mm -hmm. reads because I was struggling with my credence and my mission as, you know, we all we were. Do. Yep. And so I found such solace and strength in that book, reading the stories of these various women and their progression and how they met their goals. How did that come about? And what is its significance today and for the future for both men and yeah. women? I had been doing the Cultivating Place podcast for about a year and a half when Timber Press approached me having listened to the podcast and the interviews I was engaged in. And a lot of them were about people engaged with plants and trying to uh, progress or advance a, a social or environmental goal for themselves as well. And to sort of marry their love of plants with their wanting to make the world a better place. And when Timber Press came to me and said, would you be interested in writing a book on women in horticulture? I said, yes, I would. Uh, but I, you know, I would want to approach it with the very specific lens that I used, not how to, but again, this more kind of philosophical and contemplative exploration. And so um, that was really exciting. And they very much wanted it to be about uh, current women, not, you know, sort of, and, and that was my one parameter is, um, you know, I, I didn't want to write, none of us wanted me to write about dead white English women. We wanted to write about living women doing innovative work right now. And so it was, it was, as you say, your experience of it in early 2020, when it when it launched into the world, my experience throughout the entirety of 2018, immersed in the work of these women, you know, um, Rowan White and Robin Wall Kimmerer and Margaret Roach and um, so many women doing fantastic work in all fields that we might consider horticultural. So. It could be garden writing, it could be garden communication like you and me, it could be public policy, garden administration, introducing plants or holding nurseries, just great diversity of women. So for me to be immersed in this work where these women were engaged in honoring their passion for plants and horticulture, but also striving very consciously to make the world a better place, whether that was economically or around social justice or around environmental crisis or community disparity. It was one of those 
experiences where you take your eyes off of all that's wrong in the world and you focus so completely on those people who are doing real things to make to be the solution to these problems that are so daunting to us and it it totally changed my own mindset and it it reinvigorated me as well to kind of double down on this in encouragement and empowerment of home gardeners everywhere um, to remember that this activity that we are engaged in as gardeners has powerful and important ramifications in our world. You know, whether it's just that we have a little front yard garden that a neighborhood child walks by and that experience for them alters what they see as beautiful or what they see as valuable in the world. That right there is a powerful impact. It gives you the really important reminder that we all have the, the capacity to take the agency of our own work and put it to best use in our world. And I think the more of us that change the way we speak about gardening and change the way we demonstrate how we value gardening, the more we can shift that paradigm and that value structure in our larger culture. You know, and, and I think you're right. And, and I, I certainly see this all the time that it's us as gardeners who often dismiss it or diminish it ourselves because, because it doesn't sort of rank in our culture's um, things of valuable endeavors, right? So if you gave me a Saturday where nobody was paying attention to me and I could do anything I wanted to do, I would be out in my nightgown in the garden with my coffee playing. Now, if, but if other people are paying attention, I'd be like, oh, I have to do the marketing and the laundry and take the kids to soccer and, you know, whatever it might be that is, seems more productive. But that time in the garden is, is directly contributing to our well-being, to the well-being of our environment and our communities. And that is productive, productive too, whether or not we really have to always be productive. But, you know, we, we encourage our kids to sit down and read a book. We encourage our families to go to church on Sunday. We encourage these kinds of activities that build us as humans. And I honestly believe that that gardening is one of, of those activities, like, like reading or painting or music or, or really good cooking. It is part of our really important cultural literacy. So now you're um, adding to our literacy yet again in 2021 with another treasure, Under Western Skies, Visionary Gardens from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Coast, a collaboration with photographer Caitlin Atkinson. What prompted this book and how did you select these gardens? I had turned in the manuscript for The Earth in Her Hands and my acquiring editor at Timber Press mentioned offhand, um, you know, I know you must be tired from the first book, but there's this project that I think you would just be so perfect for, but I know you're too busy. And I said, well, you know, put it out there. What, what is it? And maybe, you know, maybe I would have the, the capacity. And so when she told me about this project that the photographer Caitlin Atkinson had brought to Timber, um, proposing a book focusing on gardens of the North American West that really integrated the, the place that they were gardening um, with their own beautiful garden, sort of you know, not overusing natural resources, not uh, gardening as though they, you know, lived in up, upper state New York, upstate New York instead of Montana. And I, I read the proposal and I saw Caitlin Atkinson, who I knew, and I loved her photography already, but when I saw the photographs of the gardens that she put in her initial proposal, I, I just said that that is the universe calling me because everything I focus on in cultivating place is about that that conversation and that marriage between humans and their places to make these things we know of as gardens and to do this better and better all the time. And her vision was so in sync with my vision that, I, you know, and I had just finished writing about people 
And so to then be asked to write about places and place-based people just felt like it was the, the, you know, a wonderful full circle of two books that really represented my mission on the podcast. And so um, we just got the first copies, Linda. It's a beautiful book. And Caitlin's photography is, is as insightful and full of narrative as it is beautiful. Like, you know, and in, in The Earth in Her Hands, I talk about the garden photographers and their importance to us as gardeners in in what they photograph and how they photograph and how they frame meaning into the images and how much better really good ones do it. Um, and, and those that are being really conscious about not just making a pretty picture, but telling a meaningful story. And that is what Caitlin is all about in this book. Caitlin had a handful of gardens that she had in mind that she really wanted to include. And I have a lot of contacts through the through family and life experience. And then through the podcast, I have a lot of contacts with gardeners around the West. And so together we put together this, this list. They all had to meet the criteria of the people in them, the garden owners had to actually be gardeners. They had to be out there in the dirt. Now, that doesn't mean they have to be the only people out there. Uh, a lot of them have some help. Um, some of them don't. They're just, you know, standard home gardeners, not just. They're standard home gardeners who do this, you know, a little bit every week over 20 years or whatever it is. Um, but others have bigger budgets and landscape architects and garden help, but they are all actually hands-on gardeners themselves. And they all are very... Um, oh integrated with the natural history and culture of the places that they're in. So they are working with their climate. They're not all native plant purists, but they are all native plant um, fans and, uh, and they participate in including and learning about the native plants of their area to include in their garden. They are all focused on um, including more plants for habitat, including landscape design that uses less natural resources. So less water, less fertilizer or food or inputs, less maintenance, um, so that our gardens are then contributing to uh, the environmental health and well-being of their area. And that to me was, was really interesting. And so you might, it might look like a coffee table book, but when you open the pages and you start looking through the pictures, it won't look like your standard, you know, gardens of the rich and famous. It will, I hope, really expand what people see as beautiful for through the picture first and then through the words that they, they might read as well as to what makes a garden a really great garden. Well, thank you, Jennifer. You are a true joy. So I hope that people will discover Cultivating Place. How can they listen and how can they engage with you on social media? Well, they can always find me on my website, which is cultivatingplace.com. And then I am on social media, uh, but I definitely am most engaged on Instagram. There's just only so many hours in the day, Linda, you and I know that. So I, yes. I'm not on Twitter at all. I'm sorry. And uh, I'm on Facebook just a little bit. So if you want to find me, Instagram is the way to go. You're always welcome to email me, which is uh, cultivatingplace at gmail.com. And you can find Cultivating Place uh, streaming on all of the podcast platforms. And now you can also find me on Central Texas Gardener, which is um, a source of great pride to me. 